Here you are, focusing on your breath with your eyes closed. What are you doing for other people? You're actually doing a lot. You're bringing your mind under control. The extent to which you can get rid of greed, aversion, and delusion inside yourself, that means there's less greed, aversion, and delusion to inflict on other people. And you're setting a good example. True happiness is found not by going out and trying to straighten other people out. It's by straightening your own mind out. Because the source of suffering is inside. It's in our own lack of skill. And you can't make other people skillful, but you can train yourself to be more skillful. And in doing so, you set a good example, and you have a more solid base to offer advice to others. The extent to which you can improve the quality of your mind. also helps to repay the debts you owe to others. As the Buddha said, one of the motivations for practicing is that if you can attain awakening, then all the good that other people have done for you comes back to them many times over. You're taking this body, you're taking this mind, the gift from your parents, and you're using it well. The merit goes back to them. So there are lots of ways in which training your mind is really a gift. That means if you're going to give a gift to somebody else, you want to give a nice gift. You're sitting here with your mind all over the place. It's not much of a gift. Try to make your mind one, here with the breath, and whatever way of getting the mind to settle down works for you. That's what you pursue. There's no one right way of getting the mind into concentration. Each person's mind is going to find a different topic to be calming. Although you find that some topics can take you only so far and others will take you even farther. The breath takes you very far. So you may find that you want to work with a few other topics first to get the mind in the right mood, so that it's ready to settle down with the breath. Sometimes thinking about the impermanence of life outside, all the things you've worked for or are working for right now at some point are going to be washed away, burned away, or just fall apart on their own. So where are you going to find any real happiness? Well, that reflection we had earlier, we're all subject to aging, illness, and death. We haven't gone beyond aging, illness, and death. These things are a normal part of life. Separation is a normal part of life. What do you have to hold on to when you're going to be separated from all that is dear and appealing to you? Well, you've got your actions, and your actions come from where they come from the mind. So it gives you even more incentive to get the mind to settle down here in the present moment and work on the intentions of the mind, because that's what we're working on here as we focus our meditation, get into concentration. The Thai translation for samadhi or concentration is firm intention, dang jai man. You're really right here. Your intention is to stay right here, and that intention doesn't waver. Whatever wavering you may have, you try to figure out some way to get past it, to iron it out. So this gift you're giving to the world right now, the quality of your mind, 
is a gift of high value. It's not one of those gifts where if you have lots of thoughts, then, then you have lots of gifts to give to others. It's more the type of gift where, say you've got a durian, the fruit they grow in around the area, and what Dhamma said it. And if the market is full of durian, durian doesn't have much use, doesn't have much value. But if there's only one durian in the whole market, That durian is going to have a high price, and usually ends up being given as a gift to someone special. So try to make your mind one here as a good gift that you want to give to somebody special. Think about all the people for whom you have debts, or with whom you have debts. Their parents are number one. and dedicate the quality of your meditation to them. It's a lucky parent who has a child who's a good example. So you want to be that good example. Then you spread that goodness out in all directions, so the goodness you received from the fact that you've got this human body. You can spread out to the world at large. And this doesn't mean going out and running around teaching people, but it does mean being a good example and developing a quality of mind that's a good influence in the world. The mind has its currents, and when they're concentrated, they can be strong. You, you want to use them in a good direction. This is why we talk about not just plain concentration, but right concentration. Right concentration that's based on skillful intent. The intent not to harm. The intent not to pursue sensual desires. Because there is concentration that's wrong. Concentration where you try to get power over other people. That creates lots of bad karma. You're trying to get power over your mind, realizing that your greed, inversion, and delusion, if <clears throat> they're not brought under control, can keep on creating trouble for a long time to come. You see this all around us. People who gain positions of power, they've obviously got some good karma from the past. But how many people actually use their power well? Son of John in Thailand who talked about the three types of merit. It comes from generosity, the merit that comes from virtue, the merit that comes from, from meditating. He was talking to a lot of people who tended to be happy to give gifts, but weren't so interested in following the precepts or practicing meditation. He said if you just give gifts, follow the precepts or meditate, then you have a good chance of being reborn as a dog in a, an American home. Your life is comfortable, but you don't know much of anything, and there's no opportunity to really do good with what you got. If you practice the precepts and are generous, then you have the opportunity to be born as a human being. But if you don't meditate, especially if you don't develop discernment, The wealth you have could actually be harmful to you. You turn around and use that wealth in ways that are destructive to yourself, destructive to others. We see a lot of that around us. So you want to be able to develop discernment as well, and that requires that the mind settle in and be very still, because otherwise your discernment is just going to be what you've read in books. And it's actually going to cover up and be a glaze over the opportunity to gain your own genuine discernment. But 
which comes from developing your own powers of observation, getting the mind still and then watching it. In the same way that you get a child still in a classroom, give it work to do, and then you've got to watch the child, because the child is probably going to want to do something else. If the teacher's gaze slips away, the child might run off. Or might do something else besides the work that it was meant to do. So it's in watching the tendency to misbehave. That's where you learn about your own mind. So you've got the mind here with a task to do. Stay with your object of concentration. And then watch the mind to see when it's going to slip off, why it's going to slip off. That's where you gain discernment. This morning I was asked a lot of questions by a woman who's read an awful lot in the Abhidhamma about the different states of mind. And the words she had and the concepts she had were way beyond anything that she could observe for herself when she was getting all confused. You've got to put that stuff aside. And John Munn's phrase was to take all your knowledge you've learned from your Dharma textbooks and put them in a trunk, put a lock on the trunk for the time being, and watch your mind. If you want to learn about greed, watch your own greed. You learn about aversion, watch your own aversion. If you want to learn about delusion, Okay, look at your actions and notice when you do something, what actually happens. When you change what you do, what happens? Okay, what's the difference? It's learning to make distinctions like this that you see, okay, one type of way of focusing the mind is better than another way. One way of dealing with the breath is better than another way. Now, some of the things you may observe may be true across time, and others may be true just for tonight. But you learn how to observe that as well. We're here to test the Buddha's teachings, but in order to test them, you have to make yourself into a good tester. Someone whose powers of observation and circumspection are well developed. That quality of circumspection is one that John Lee emphasizes a lot. In other words, you gain an insight, we have to turn it around. To what extent is the opposite true? You don't want to just run with one idea beyond where it really applies. And when an insight comes, okay, the best thing to do is ask yourself, can it be applied right now? And if so, you apply it, and then you see what the results are. Don't immediately decide that whatever it is, it's got to be true. That belief that whatever comes up and is still mind can be trusted can't be trusted. You've got to test things. That's where the circumspection comes in. You test them, and you test them again. And your knowledge of the ins and outs of the mind gets a lot more subtle. So this is how you take your gift to the world, which is the current of energy that the mind sends out both while it's sitting here still and when it's using that current to speak or act. And you're making it a gift of high value, something you can be proud to present. You present this to your parents, you present this to all the people who've been good to you, to all the people you respect. And then from that you spread it to everybody. This is how we improve the world, one person at a time. It's the only way that lasting improvements can be made. <laughs>